Over the past 53 years, Amtrak has operated a ton of routes across the US and Canada. Many have been great hits with passengers, but some others, well, not so much. Today I'd like to shine a spotlight on six Amtrak trains that didn't quite catch on, but I'll be excluding ones that simply had a name change. Now I'd also like to shine a spotlight on today's sponsor, NordVPN. What's a VPN? It's a virtual private network that encrypts your connection to the internet, hides your IP address, and provides a more secure way to access public internet hotspots. Imagine you're sitting in a train station and want to connect to the public Wi-Fi. You don't know what kind of scheming little hackers are out there waiting for you to access your bank account or personal details. Or how about this? Imagine you're laying over for several hours waiting for your next train and you want to watch your favorite show or YouTube video, but it's not available in your country. With just one click or tap, you can connect to one of Nord's 6,000 plus servers in over 111 countries and be protected from hackers and access all of your favorite media on up to 10 devices at one time. Nord also helps protect against malware, malicious websites, ads, and trackers with Threat Protection Pro. You can get a discounted two-year plan plus four months extra using my unique link, nordvpn.com slash amtrakguy365, or click the link in the description. NordVPN has 24-7 customer support, and it's risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. We're starting off on the sunny west coast with the spirit of California. It was an overnight train running between Los Angeles and Sacramento starting October 25th, 1981. Previously, the Southern Pacific operated the overnight Lark train here, but that was discontinued in 1968. Hosting coach, cafe, and sleeping car accommodations, one daily round trip left LA in the evening and arrived in Sacramento the next morning, complementing the daytime Coast Starlight train that also operated on the line. The spirit of California looked to capitalize on commuters, students, and travelers who couldn't reserve a spot on the often sold out Coast Starlight. Come 1983, however, George Duke Magian was elected governor of California and sought out a more balanced budget for the state. This meant cutting funding for the train, and it ran for the last time on September 30th, 1983, after one year and 11 months of service. In the Keystone State, the Fort Pitt was a daily train serving Pittsburgh and Altoona, Pennsylvania starting April 26th, 1981. It shared equipment with the Pennsylvanian, which at the time ran from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia. Upon arriving in Pittsburgh, the train would turn around and run back east to Altoona as the Fort Pitt. The train looked to be a more convenient and easy way to do business and pleasure trips while avoiding the highway. The Pennsylvania Department of Transportation provided $547,453 in funding, but on average the train only carried around 30 passengers daily. Ultimately, this wasn't enough to justify keeping the service, and it was discontinued on January 30th, 1983, after running for one year and nine months. Moving to the Midwest, there was the Lake Country Limited running between Chicago, Illinois and Janesville, Wisconsin beginning April 15th, 2000. If you'd like a more detailed look at this train, you can watch my video about it here. In 1997, the government mandated that Amtrak become financially self-sufficient by 2003 or face liquidation. I'm gonna tear down Amtrak with my bare hands! <laughs> so, Amtrak took an interest in hauling express freight and mail to increase profits. As part of the network growth strategy plan, routes like the Lake Country Limited would focus on freight but retain limited passenger service. The consist was certainly unique outside of the single horizon coach for passengers, often hosting a baggage car and some number of road railers to carry mail, paper products, and pet food. On average, only five or six passengers rode the train daily, increasing to 10 or 11 in the summer. The awkward schedule and slow speeds greatly hindered the train's performance. In March 2001, Amtrak gave a six-month cancellation notice after a contract to haul auto parts from General Motors didn't pan out, and the planned connecting mix train, the Skyline Connection, never came to be. Service went from daily to weekly, traffic fell to basically nothing, and it was discontinued on September 23rd, 2001, after one year and five months of operation. Moving south to central Illinois, the Prairie Marksman inaugurated daily service between Chicago and East Peoria on August 10, 1980. The original plan was to have the service extend into the bigger city of Peoria, but Santa Fe wasn't interested in hosting the train on their tracks, 
So Amtrak and the Illinois Department of Transportation settled on a route via the Illinois Central Gulf and Toledo, Peoria, and Western. The service was intended to be a 14-month pilot project to study the feasibility of the route. 150 passengers a day was the required target, but the first week of service presented only 60 per day, later falling to 30 or fewer. A survey found that residents in Peoria were aware of the train and its awkwardly located station in East Peoria, but didn't view the service as a practical way of getting to Chicago, and the bus was cheaper and more frequent anyway. The train was losing $120,000 per month, and soon enough, IDOT ceased funding, and the last run took place on October 4, 1981. The Prairie Marksman lasted one year and one month. Over in Chicagoland, the campus began operating on Fridays and Sundays between Chicago and Champaign, Illinois on November 14, 1971. This train is so obscure and early in Amtrak's history, I'm not even sure if there's pictures of it out there, at least not that I could find. Maybe this one? I'm not sure if it's the campus, though. One source says it operated with Illinois Central Diesels and five coaches, including a coach bar lounge pulled from the IC and Norfolk and Western rosters. The train's primary job was serving students at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. It was a very lucrative business, so much so that during the Illinois Central days, they'd often have to add extra coaches. The Chicago to Champaign corridor was supplemented by the daily Shawnee and Panama Limited trains, with the Illini running on Fridays. However, Amtrak was in the process of moving trains that served Chicago Central Station over to Union Station. Moving the campus and Illini there would add an extra 35 to 40 minutes to the schedule, something Amtrak deemed impractical and would discourage ridership. So, the Illini and campus made their final runs on March 2nd and 5th, 1972 respectively, with the campus being the last train to serve Central Station. The train lasted a fleeting 3 months and 20 days. On a brighter note, the Illini would be revived as a daily train in 1973 along the same route as the campus, and today, it still runs as part of the Illinois services, now extended to Carbondale. If you're in the mood for a party, the Las Vegas Limited would have been for you. Service on Fridays and Sundays between Los Angeles, California and Las Vegas, Nevada began May 21, 1976. It followed in the footsteps of Southern Pacific's Reno Fun Train and a handful of Vegas-bound excursions offered by Amtrak throughout the 60s and 70s. These trains hosted quite the lively atmosphere with live entertainment, fine dining and alcohol, dancing and retrofitted baggage cars, and themed parties, all while traveling through the picturesque landscape of the Sierra Nevada mountains. In Vegas, passengers would disembark to indulge in the vibrant nightlife in casinos. The Las Vegas Limited differed from the excursions in that it was officially listed in timetables as a regularly scheduled train and had no set end date. Even with the discounted fares offered in package deals with 11 Vegas hotels, ridership fell short and Amtrak blamed publicist Iron Horse Incorporated for the lack of advertising. The state of Nevada canceled funding, and the last train ran on August 6, 1976 after a staggeringly short two months and 17 days of operation. Acting as a more conventional replacement, from 1979 to 97, Amtrak's Desert Wind train would serve Los Angeles and Vegas. As for the Reno Fun Train, it would carry on sporadically as a chartered excursion hosted by key holidays using Amtrak crew and equipment, but the last one ran in 2017, and there hasn't been much news of it coming back. Looking back on these trains, it was often a case of lack of funding or the market just wasn't there. In certain cases, it is simply easier, cheaper, and just more convenient to get in the car and drive. However, American interest in passenger trains and public transportation projects has seen quite the increase within the past decade. Many people don't want to deal with the ever-increasing highway congestion or frustrating experiences at airports. Amtrak's Connects Us plan looks to enhance or expand existing services and create new ones across the country. Some cities like Las Vegas, Cheyenne, Duluth, Nashville, Green Bay, among many others, may finally see a return of passenger rail. We can only hope that people will consider riding the rails and that Amtrak continues to receive the funding it needs to establish new services and buy new equipment. Ooh. Yeah, I wrote this before the rather unfortunate election results came in. Anyway, if the Borealis' ridership is anything to go off of, the people want more trains.
Thank you to my channel members. Special thanks to Mooter, Tommy Rosini, Grand Canyon Studios, Amtrak Fan 19, Gojira's Trains, Aaron Forestry YT, The Winnipeg Railfan, Shenandoah Valley Railfan, Jacko Beans, Pun Cake, Jackboy317, and Trains Railfan Gaming 1066 for subscribing to the Conductor tier. Seriously, I really genuinely do appreciate your extra support. It really does mean a lot. Anywho, that's all for me, so thank you so much for watching, thank you again to NordVPN for sponsoring me, and I'll see you in another video.